Hello and welcome to this very special stream in celebration of David Graeber's life and work. David's political contributions as an author, as an academic and as a lifelong troublemaker had a profound impact on everyone you'll be hearing from this evening, including John McDonnell, Jeremy Corbyn, Grace Blakely, Al Pashar, David Wengro, Molly Crabapple. But he was also, in addition to all of these things, a treasured friend, a beloved teacher. And I don't think that it's any exaggeration to say that there wouldn't even be a Navarro media if it wasn't for David Graeber. The news of David's passing earlier this month was devastating, not least for his wife, Nika Dubrovsky, and the close friends who were with him in Venice. And I think I speak for everyone here at Navarra and everyone on the live stream too when I say that we've got nothing but love for all those who love David. And they have all our solidarity and empathy at this time and the days to come. I'd like to take this moment just to say that David's wife Nika and many of his friends are organizing a carnival in his honor on October the 11th. It will be both streamed online and it will take place IRL outside and socially distanced of course. There are plans for events in multiple different countries and if that sounds like something you'd like to participate in go to davidgraber.industries and you can find out more information there. By way of introduction, I guess I'd like to say that David was one of the left's most brilliant thinkers and the range of people we have speaking here tonight, I think, reflects the sheer scope of David's thinking. From anthropological studies of magic and slavery to the petty cruelties and rituals of busyness which uh, dominate the 21st century office, David brought originality and mischief to absolutely everything that he wrote. But where others might confine themselves to the ivory tower of the academy or like a private members club after the first book does well, David could be found wherever struggle was, whether that was Rojava or Occupy Wall Street or a squatted social centre or a university cleaner's dispute. And with his funny voice and his rumpled hair and his shirt, which was never, ever ironed, sitting there munching on gluey hummus, it was really easy to forget that David was a properly famous public intellectual. Because it's not the David of book jackets that I'm going to miss the most. It's the David who always had wonky buttons, who loped around London laughing this laugh, which could just scare seagulls off of their perch. It's the David who considered nobody disposable or unworthy of his time. And it's the David who a few years ago, uh, when he spotted me outside of a pub, came bounding up and asked if I wanted to see something crazy. Uh, and then he pulled an engagement ring out of his coat pocket and was like, I'm going to ask somebody to marry me. And then sort of laughed off and ran off into the evening. And we're going to hear a lot of people's memories of David about the effect that he's had on their work and their thinking. And we're honored to be able to hear from his co-workers and his comrades and we'll also be watching some selected clips from his talks so that we can tell the story of David's life in politics. So first up we'll begin with a reflection on David's time with Occupy Wall Street. David was credited though he claimed otherwise with coining the slogan we are the 99% and here's a clip from a speech David gave in 2012 in New York. How many people have heard of the concept of the paradox of sovereignty? Okay, one. Uh, this is a really interesting idea, actually. Uh, it blew me away when I first heard it. So the basic idea is like once kings had this arbitrary power of life and death over their subjects, um, that's what sovereignty actually means. Um, <coughs> nowadays, it is the people who are sovereign. That's the um, and. Over time, this idea came to be attached to democracy. That's what democracy it was. Um, now, there's a basic problem. So, like, in theory, the police, uh, the government, it's a monopoly of course of force. They're the only people who have the legitimate right to use violence. Um, why do, is it legitimate for them to use violence? Because they are enforcing the law, right? Um, where does the law come from? The law comes from the Constitution. Okay, where does the Constitution come from? The legitimacy of the Constitution. The legitimacy of the Constitution comes from the people. That's popular sovereignty, right? How did the people actually establish the legitimacy of the Constitution? Through violent revolution. <laughs> um, so, in other words, 
the legitimacy of the code of laws which allows the police to use force comes from acts of illegal violence, <laughs> which is what revolution is, because after all, I mean, the people who created modern constitutions, the American French Revolution, all committed treason according to the laws under which they were brought up. Violent treason, you know, the up uprising. Um, so this creates a basic problem. If sovereign power is ultimately, the legitimacy comes from the right of the people to revolt, um, well, how do you tell the difference between the people and a rampaging mob, you know? Um, you know, when do you have to do what they say and when, do you, when is it okay to kill them? Uh, nobody's actually ever been able to solve this problem legally. Um, the basic answer seems to be in retrospect. You know, if they win, that was the people. So I think one of my favorite things about listening to him talk is that you can hear that like mid-sentence laugh he would do and then he'd have to like take a deep breath and recover and then finish the rest of his thought um yeah i always find that really funny to watch um well with me to uh talk a bit about uh david's relationship to occupy is molly crabapple who is speaking to us live from new york i didn't mean to make that sound like an snl intro but there we are thank you so much for joining us molly thank you so much ash it's such a pleasure to speak to you and thank you everyone at novara for doing this I only met David some years after Occupy, but even before you know, I knew him, he had changed my life and the lives of many thousands of other people in New York. David was, in as much as anyone could be said to have found, founded Occupy, which I know he would have rejected, David was one of the founders of Occupy. He was the person who coined the term 99%. And, and I think what, what I got from that clip and what I got seeing him speak was that he was the rare genius academic who could speak to people just like normal humans. Like he had this mischievous little boy's face. You, you said it so well when you spoke about that, that laugh that he would have. Just, just this like, I don't know, like enthusiasm for the world. And he would take the most complicated, you know, impossible concepts, concepts about debt, concepts about the economy, about power, really, really, really sophisticated stuff. And he would break it down so that, you know, people like me who didn't graduate college could understand them. He would, he, he called it in his books being, being generous to his readers. Um, and when I think about David and when I think most about what I'll miss about him, in addition to him, you know, being this genius intellectual and the guy that founded a movement that changed the lives of so many people, I, I think I'll miss that generosity. Um, it's a profoundly ungenerous time that we're in right now. It's a profoundly mean, cramped time in the world. And for me, David was the exact opposite of that. He was someone who just had so much in him and was so willing to expend all of that, that profound and miraculous life force on people who had no power, on people who were in rebellion and... Um, yeah, he was just he was just generous. I first started reading David's work um, actually in Zuccotti Park. I probably cribbed one of the books in you know from from the Occupy Library, and I remember that Debt was one of those books that made all of these things sort of click crystalline clear in my brain. And I think it did that with so many other people. They they realized that it wasn't just their fault that they weren't succeeding at the system. It wasn't just their fault that se things seemed so horribly, achingly wrong. He let people who hadn't thought, you know, in terms of a structural analysis, see the structures that were, were holding them down. And I think this is a gift that he gave, gave so many people. Um, we corresponded for years, very often, you know, pretty, pretty briefly, very often about how to you know, raise money for some Greek social center that was in trouble. That, that was my last, my last text with him. But we only hung out once in earnest, and that was a few years ago, and it was in uh, Portobello Road. And he had me meet him at some squatted social center that was filled with Kurdish solidarity activists and had a big sign that said, no journalists allowed. And I... Um, I introduced myself and I said that I was I was journalist scum, but they let me stay anyway. And then I remember um, he took me all around the Portobello Road Market, and he knew absolutely everyone, including all the the old dudes that sold books and you know 
trade union activists and just like everyone. He knew everyone. He had such a fucking hunger for life. This is why I can't believe he's dead. How can anyone who is so hungry, so so hungry and so greedy for life be gone? Like, how could we have lost him, you know? Um, and I remember, this is just, it's a silly memory, but I uh, was looking at, there's a book by an illustrator I liked that I just didn't have the money for. And he he just like bought it for me on a whim. You know, he just said that he liked gifts. He liked giving gifts. He liked getting gifts. And, um, you know, he was everyone who, who knew him even, even briefly. It was, that was the most profound gift. I am sorry if this sounds like emotional attack. <laughs> no, no, no. That's exactly what rings true for me. And it was something I was talking about with my partner before the stream, which is he had this incredible interest in people, just fascinated by people, always wanted to be where people were. Just um, a, a question I'd be interested to hear your take on it is, how did you see him influence the movements that he was a part of? What do you think he gave that other people took up and carried with them? I think he introduced, um, you know, anti-authoritarianism, like, you know, collect collective decision making, um, and also just like a sort of kindness and gentleness, which I know sounds strange, but that's like something profoundly so lacking on the left, right? And um, a sort of a, a good faith, I want to say, um, into everything he did, whether it was, you know, he was doing stuff with Occupy or doing stuff with, you know, Rojava and with, with Kurdish movements. And he wasn't, there are a lot of people who are so willing to write people off if they disagree with them and say like, this person is scum. But he, he was like, no, he, he would listen to people. Sometimes he would decide they were scum, but he would hear people out and he was never someone who was so sure that he knew everything on earth, even though he was absolutely fucking brilliant. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us this evening, uh, Molly. It's been wonderful to hear from you. And you know what? I like it when, you know, and a lefty event, someone injects a bit of emotional intelligence um, <laughs> rather than having it be all dry theory. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you for this beautiful tribute. Well, there's still time for it to go very, very wrong. Um, so I think a picture that we get of David is that he was an incredibly versatile uh, political actor. And you saw a clip of him addressing um, essentially a, a, a proto-insurrectionist movement uh, in the park. But he could do that. And he could also speak to, you know, the suits and ties and execs at Google HQ. And that's the next clip that I want to introduce here. Um, here is David Graeber at Google HQ explaining the moment that inspired him to write Debt, the first 5,000 years, which is of course, one of his most widely read and influential books. And just as a bit of background, in this clip, David is telling a story uh, where he told an acquaintance about the consequences of structural adjustment policies in Madagascar, and then the person he was talking to really shocked him. It's an odd book in a way because it starts from trying to grapple with kind of a moral and political problem which is what is this hold that the idea of debt has over people's imaginations that, that morality itself comes to be thought of as a matter of paying one's debts um i guess i was first really confronted with it i uh, started conceived the notion of writing this book when i was some um, for some reason or another i was at a garden party at westminster abbey after a while, he introduced me to this person who he said was a, I'd have a lot in common with, a, a activist lawyer, just involved in a lot of um, community work and various things like that. So I, I chatted with her, and she was talking about her activism and asked me about mine. And I was talking about campaigns that I'd been involved with, involved in the global justice movement for many years, about the IMF structural adjustment policies and their effects on various parts of the world. Um, I had spent two years in Madagascar, and Madagascar had um, undergone all sorts of IMF structural adjustment over the years with various confusing effects. Um, some of them were actually kind of ironically quite good, like the state basically sort of pulled up stakes and left a large parts of the countryside because they figured they weren't getting any taxes out of the countryside anyway, and people sort of managing their own affairs completely autonomously, and that was cool. Uh, but they also did things like withdraw support for mosquito eradication programs. I was telling the story, and, and she was very sympathetic, and she said, well, yes, but what were you, you know, as a 
activists, what were you proposing to do about this? And I said, well, we were involved in the Drop the Debt campaign, you know, this thing called Jubilee 2000. Um, so the debt of, of the Global South should be forgiven. And her, her reaction was um, somewhat shocked and mortified. She was like, well, but they borrowed the money, you know? I mean, surely people have to pay their debts. It was something about the way it was just so commonsensical. Um, and, you know, as an activist, you know, your first reaction when you see this is say, oh, that conversation, all oh, right. You know, I thought this was a friend. Okay, wait, which one do I do? You know, there's like 12 different responses you can do. Do I say, well, they didn't really borrow the money. I'm a dictator who put it in a Swiss bank account. Do you say, well, actually, they paid the money about 20 times over at this point just through the miracle of, of compounded interest. You know, they'll never get out. Um, there's a million different responses. Actually, the response I think I, I came up with thought would be most effective in that context was the economical one, which is, you know, if profits are your reward for taking a risk, well, you're supposed to be taking a risk. So, I mean, the whole point of a financial system is to guide money towards wise investments. And if you have a system like the IMF imposed on most of the world where you're going to get paid back no matter what you do, there's absolutely no incentive to make intelligent loans. Um, but what really struck me was that sort of commonsensical Oh, I mean, you, you have to pay your debts. Uh, I mean, I thought, well, this is a very nice person. She just heard a story which involved 7,000 dead babies. Um, how, what other circumstance would she try to justify killing 7,000 babies? Probably not. So what is it about the idea of debt that, that it can justify things in people's minds that we, we'd almost never imagine defending otherwise? And it set me off, um, and I started thinking about debt itself. And the history of debt, what is debt? Um, where does it come from? How long have we been thinking in these terms? How long has it had this moral power? And I, I quickly, when I started doing initial research, discovered a number of rather surprising things. One of them was that no one has ever written a history of debt, which is kind of shocking because really there aren't that many things that no one's ever written a history of. If you think about it, you know, people have written histories of salt. People have written, written histories of different types of fish. Uh, there, there's, a French, um, there's a French historian who wrote a history of shit. It's actually, you know, human waste <laughs> disposal over the years. Um, you know, pretty much anything you can think of, um, there's a guy who's written a history of that. How is it that no one's ever written a history of debt? And of course, David went on to write that history of debt. Um, our next speaker is someone who knows a thing or two about heterodox economics. And one of the things that I want to ask him is just how did an anarchist like David Graeber become so influential in left-wing policymaking circles, which were much more statist in their orientation? So please join me in welcoming a former Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, John McDonnell, to the stream. Oh, you're just on mute there, John. Maybe I've silenced you, or it's GCHQ. You normally do silence me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, because, I want to say it's because what David was doing is quite remarkable, really. It was all, he almost embodied that coming back together of progressive movements that divided over a century ago between anarchism and some going off into state socialism in that sense. So he was such a he was such a reminder of what really that division should never have occurred. And every all his work is based upon um, just can't you just leave it to the people themselves and trust the people themselves? And as you as you just heard from his work in Madagascar about the withdrawal of the state then meant that people themselves came together and organized themselves in, in such a way as to achieve their objectives of living together in harmony. Although, as he said, the state itself then did damage by withdrawing those some essential supplies. Um, but I think that's what Dave was all about, really, um, just trying to, um, trying to ensure that there was a respect for people and their ability to develop their own worldview as well as their own actions that would achieve that worldview i think that was it so he was bringing together i suppose <clears throat> the progressive tradition that's that that split unnecessarily 
so long ago you know there was that thing that there was always that expression you know we all have our own Kronstadt so that was basically some you know the, a left hard man usually saying we've got to wipe these anarchists out because they're just undermining the potential of revolution in fact what David was trying to argue actually that anarchist tradition of relying and respecting the people and their views and the crowd actually not only didn't undermine the revolution it most probably made the revolution more permanent and more effective that was it really um, uh, um, I was wondering if you could tell me just a bit more in the kind of role well, David played in breaking that conventional economic wisdom, which yeah, I know is well, something you're invested in yourself. Well, take the, take these. I'll, I'll do some. Uh, let me tell you about David. I, I first, see. I think David. I've always. I thought David always existed. I, I, he was always there. I always. It's going to be real. This is going to be. It is tragic. His loss and it's dreadful. And I don't know how we can come to terms with it, because most of us, certainly over the last decade or so, he's always been there. Um, and he's he's always been there as an activist intellectual. You, he's described as a public intellectual. I'm not completely sure that means apart from maybe everyone seems to think they all, he's part of them. That was it, I think. I think that's the meaning of public intellectual for David. He's a part of our thought processes to be taken into account and to be engaged in all of that. His work on debt, work on debt is, is phenomenal. It's a phenomenal piece of work. But he's, actually, he writes it in the style of how he speaks as well. Because that anecdote about the, the woman in Westminster Abbey, uh, then in the Westminster Garden Party that he came up, is the beginning of the book. What I like about it as well, where he, he gets it for, she's, he's explaining the role of the IMF. So how does David explain the role of the IMF? Well... There are a couple of heavies who come around and break your legs every now and again when you don't pay your debts. And then he says to so he says, so she says, What are you gonna do? She says, I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of it. And then by the way, I'm also gonna scrap all debt as well. I just thought that's brilliant. And that's actually the thought logic that we've had. And and I know this sounds trite, but it's not, because actually that influenced a large number of our views about what debt is, the physical, the way it's been used almost as a form of physical force to suppress people. That then led on to actually, yeah, the IMF needs to be got rid of. We do need these institutional changes. So what's let's have that debate now. And then, you know, many of us campaigned around Jubilee 2000, getting rid of debt overall. And in his book, in in debt, he says, look, in the book itself, he says, I don't come up with policy recommendations usually. I don't. That's not my thing. I, I de describe, explain, etc. But I, his last bit in the book is. I will come up with one. Um, he said, let's, let's scrap debt. Let's get rid of debt, personal and global. And actually, that's what we've got to do. I think we're at, we're at that stage where there's two things. One is, I think, we needed, I think we need a debt jubilee in this country at the moment. And if David was here now, I'd be having a conversation with him about how do we raise that argument more effectively. Uh, and the second thing is, it's blindingly obvious that we need another jet debt jubilee. The thing that um, David and others are going on to, and Petifer in particular, is that's fine, but actually the transformation of how we relate to one another globally is absolutely key in all this and the discussion about the global south. And again, that's where David came in, in, in terms of the whole discussion about um, international relationships that had to be founded upon relationships with people. So it always does get back to this anthropological anarchist that he was. And I just, how do you, combining his extraordinary knowledge in terms of his anthropological studies with his, which led, I think, to an understanding, a respect for people, but then the development of political objectives as well. I, he was phenomenal. He was extremely influential in terms of his book, Debt. But also, and this is, I've really beaten myself up about this, he, his publisher sent me the draft of his book, Bullshit Jobs. And I skimmed it, and they asked me, would I do a, a blurb for it? And I didn't get time. It was, uh, I think it was run up to the election or whatever. And also, I wanted to read it properly rather than just skim it. Um, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. because I t And I quoted it this week in another discussion that I was having. Say, so, look, there was a discussion about education or whatever and training for jobs. I said, look. You better go off and read David Graeber's uh, 
bullshit jobs book because actually it completely gives a different aspect of the role of work within our society and how so many people it's just one concept on it's so enlightening how so many of us so many people are in jobs which they know actually are completely futile and you look with envy at those people who are doing something worthwhile and i thought my god what an insight that is into modern day life at the moment that's what he used to do to me. He would throw ideas like out that or what, and I'd walk away. And you know how he, it was in that speech when he, when he does that, oh, he has that breathing space and goes on. I'd walk away. And I, about a day later, I think, bloody hell, I realised what he was talking about now. And then you'd have to take him down somewhere and find out uh, and have a proper discussion about it. The other thing about it is that I, his work on debt was absolutely phenomenal. But if you look at the stuff he did around direct democracy as well, it's, it's incredibly enlightening. And then the bullshit jobs was the next piece on, if you like, about the modern day economy, always arriving at a fundamental analysis that would realize actually you're just scraping the surface politically. You've got to go beyond that. And going beyond that always with David meant um mass engagement leave thank the people you. thank you so much for joining us tonight john and hearing your description of him as you know the anarchist anthropologist and that being the wellspring from which everything else emerged i think really just clarified it for me so thank you so much okay 30 seconds more just a oh first. go on if you if you can ping me a fiver afterwards oh i will oh well 30 seconds more my memory of david as well as as an activist not just around occupy and all the rest but when we had the campaign in my constituency against the third runway, after climate camp, there was an occupation of a site that's still going on. Um, I, get, I get invited to the celebration, God knows how many years on, of the occupation. And I walk down and I hear this voice, and it's David Graeber sitting at the back of a tent with dozens of young people in, absolutely enthralled and him talking about the whole concept of occupying direct action, et cetera. Another generation was born as a result of that, of activists was born as a result of that, that one conversation. Don't underestimate, not just his intellectual work, but his mobilizing and motivating role that he played as well. And I think we're gonna really miss that. So I think. I think we're all gonna really miss that too. I've got the same memory of watching him speak and then all of us going away after having read direct action, trying to do the wavy hands that we'd read about. Um, so he had this impact on us, a tremendous impact before I even got to meet him. So thank you for joining us, John. Really wonderful to hear from you as always. Um, and I'm so glad that John brought up anthropology because, you know, lots of people know David through his explicitly political writing. We know him as a popular author, also as an activist, as a mobilizer. But before books like Debt and Direct Action came on the scene, he was a leading light in the sometimes esoteric world of academic anthropology. And in our next clip, he explains what that discipline means to him. Yeah, I'm interested in anthropology because I'm interested in human possibilities. I mean, anthropology, I think, is the only discipline which really is about trying to understand the full range of what has been possible politically, economically, socially, and so forth. Um, and in a way, there's always been an affinity between anthropology and anarchism, simply because anthropologists know that a society without a state is possible. There's been plenty of them. They work fine. And what are some of the best? Well, I mean, you go to Amazonia, you go to... It's hard to say what's good or what's oh, bad. Okay, I said some of them yeah. without yeah. suggesting... Any particular one? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's thousands of places right now where essentially there is no functioning state where you don't know because it's working out so well. I mean, that's what I discovered in Madagascar. The state had basically pulled up stakes and left from large parts of the countryside, but nobody was stupid enough to sort of put up flags and say, ha, 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 we are independent now. You know, they mm. were just going on about their business as pretending it was there. And it took me perhaps six months to figure out what was going on, and I was living there. Now, from those observations comes a political philosophy about anarchism? Well, I was always interested in the idea of anarchism. I think that experiencing it makes it real in a certain way, living in a place like that. Uh, because I think 
as an idea, anarchism is very appealing to a lot of people. It's certainly very appealing to me. I mean, most people think it would be nice to live in a free society where people simply governed themselves and there wasn't a systematic structure of coercion regulating you all the time. Um, but most people can't imagine that it could ever happen. So when you see examples of it's happening, when you see anarchy in action and it works, it just changes your perceptions of what's possible in society and in your life. So I'm really pleased to be able to introduce someone who very recently was able to work with David very closely in this world of anthropology. David Wengro is a professor of comparative archaeology from UCL and uh, along with David Graeber, co-author of the forthcoming book, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. So sticking with something niche then, I suppose. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I was just hoping you could tell us a bit about the ideas the two of you had been cooking up. I can. I, mean, I was just reflecting, looking at those clips on the last time I actually saw David Graeber. He was in the Alexanderplatz in Berlin. I think it was actually the day before he left on that trip to Venice, which uh, he didn't come back from. I was at home in, in London and uh, I've met David very regularly since he moved here in 2008 and since the COVID lockdown we talked every day on the phone, sometimes twice or, or three times a day, but he never turned on his phone camera, except on that last occasion uh, he did. And I found it really odd at the time, and it's even odder now because it was actually the last time that we exchanged words. Um, and he was anguishing uh, about not giving enough time to his academic writing. So uh, I reminded him that we'd actually just recently uh, completed a rather long book covering the last 30,000 years of world history, which cheered him up a bit. Um, and if there's time, uh, I'd really like to read you a very short uh, excerpt from it. Uh, or I could first tell you a, a little bit more about how he came to be working with uh, an archaeologist. Um, well, why don't you uh, read us a section from the book? Sorry, I'm not sure if you could hear me for the whole thing, but yeah, definitely yeah. read to us because then I feel like I'm getting a sneak peek. Well, all right, here we go. This is from uh, chapter six um, of uh, the book that will be called The Dawn of Everything. It's from a, a subsection of that chapter called In Which We Enter Something of an Academic No-Go Zone and Discuss the Possibility of Neolithic Matriarchies. The rejection of the Neolithic goddess theory actually merits a brief digression because the very idea of primitive matriarchy has become such a bugaboo. Even suggesting that women had unusually prominent positions in early farming communities is almost an academic taboo. Perhaps it's not entirely surprising. In the same way that social rebels since the 1960s tended to idealize hunter-gatherer bands, earlier generations of poets, anarchists, and bohemians had tended to idealize the Neolithic as an imaginary, beneficent theocracy ruled over by priestesses of the great goddess, the all-powerful distant ancestor of Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte, and Demeter herself. That is, until such societies were overwhelmed by violent, patriarchal, Indo-European-speaking horse riders descending from the steppes. And how one saw this imagined confrontation actually became the source of a major political divide in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Just to give the reader a sense of what we're talking about, consider the case of Matilda Jocelyn Gage, considered in her lifetime one of the most prominent American feminists. Gage was also an anti-Christian, attracted to the Haudenosaunee matriarchate, which she believed to be one of the few surviving examples of Neolithic social organization. She was also a staunch defender of indigenous rights, so much so that she was eventually adopted as a Mohawk clan mother. Incidentally, she, she spent the last years of her life in the home of her devoted son-in-law, who was L. Frank Baum, author of the Oz books, a series of a dozen volumes in which, uh, volumes in which as many others have pointed out, we have queens, uh, good witches, and princesses, but not a single legitimate male figure of authority. 
or consider one of Sigmund Freud's two favorite students, Otto Gross, an anarchist who in the years before the Great War in Germany developed the theory that the superego was in fact patriarchy and needed to be destroyed so as to unleash the benevolent matriarchal collective unconscious, which he saw as the hidden but still living residue of the Neolithic. And he actually set out to accomplish this himself, largely through the use of drugs and polyamorous sexual relationships. Gross's work is now largely remembered for its influence on Freud's other favorite student, Carl Jung, who kept the idea of the collective unconscious, but rejected Gross's political conclusions. And of course, after the Great War, Nazis began to take up the same story of Aryan invasions from exactly the opposite perspective, representing the imagined patriarchal invaders as the ancestors of their master race. Now, with such intense politicization of what were obviously fanciful readings of history, it's hardly surprising that the whole topic became something of an embarrassment, even the intellectual equivalent of a no-go zone for subsequent generations. But it's hard to avoid the impression that something else is going on here as well. The degree of erasure has been extraordinary, far more than is warranted by mere suspicion of an overstated or outdated theory. Among academics, belief in primitive matriarchy is treated as a kind of intellectual offence, almost on a par with scientific racism, and its exponents have been written out of history. Gage from the history of feminism, Gross from that of psychology, despite him having invented such concepts as introversion and extroversion, or to have worked closely with everyone from Franz Kafka and the Berlin Dadaists to Max Weber. This is odd. After all, a century or so does seem more than enough time for the dust to settle. Why is the matter still so shrouded in taboo? I think I'm probably running out of time. Well, I think that seems like a good cliffhanger to leave it on. Um, what was lovely about listening to that excerpt is that there's this real tangible sense of just enjoying the iconoclasm a bit. And I think that's something which you see in lots of his work. And I imagine it must have just been a really lovely thing to work on with him. It was. And it was on and off a, a 10 year project. And if there's time, there's just one thing I'd like to mention briefly. Absolutely. I first got to, to know David before he moved over fully to London uh, because I was traveling regularly to New York for work at the time. And I think that's where he was always at home, really, with one exception, um, which is that not one of that city, uh, not one of New York's great universities would offer him a, a position, nor, uh, in fact, would any uh, American university at the time. Um, and it felt really absurd and unjust that I, uh, as a, a Londoner, was being welcomed as a, a visiting professor at NYU, while David Graeber, uh, a native New Yorker, was effectively in exile from American academia. And as the eulogies keep rolling out uh, about David, I just think it might be worth reflecting on some of that difficult history and what it says uh, about the status of genuinely creative social thinkers uh, in the world today at a time when I think everyone agrees uh, we really need them. I think one of the um, stories which has been revived since David's passing is the circumstances of his departure from Yale. One of the reasons was that they didn't like having an actual leftist in the department um, who would stick up for students and stick up for other workers in their struggles. I don't know anything about Yale at all. I've never been there. But I mean, what always amazed me is that none of it ever made David in any way bitter uh, or even skeptical, actually. I mean, he held on to that incredible uh, faith in, in what he was doing. And that's what was inspiring to, to me and so many uh, other people. Uh, with Alpa Shah, who's here this evening, he always used to sort of quip to us. He'd say, we three will change the course of history, uh, starting with the past. Uh, so I, I was lucky. I, I came first, but it lasted 10 years. Um, one of the things that James Butler wrote about him is that David Graeber was the opposite of a cynic. And I think exactly. that, that puts it very well. Um, I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, David. And I'm so excited to see the full book when it comes out.
it's a really special thing for David to leave us with as one last parting gift, of course, co-authored with you. Thank you. Um, so one place where David Graeber found the possibility of a stateless society being tested, or at least the subject of experimentation, was the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, better known as Rojava. And so this next clip is uh, David explaining to us at Navarre about how he came to identify with the revolution at Rojava. Well, I mean, this is one of the most exciting political experiments really since the anarchists in Spain in the 1930s. This is one of the few occasions when people have actually had a extensive uh, stretch of territory in which to try to see if libertarian socialist ideas can really be put into practice and actually work on the ground um, with a lot of really startling success, to be honest. Um, I first out, found out about the revolution and Rojava when people there contacted me. Um, and, you know, at first, I think everyone reacted with a certain degree of incredulity. I mean, is this really true? Could this be happening? Could all of this been happening for all these years? And I'd never heard about it. But, um, you know, the more I learned, the more I was really struck by how profound an historical experiment it really was. <sighs> So joining us to discuss David's involvement is Danny Ellis, an internationalist volunteer who is speaking to us from Rojava. Welcome, Danny, to the stream. Hi, Ash. How are you doing? Wow, your lighting is spectacular. <laughs> Look at that. 4K. I know. Um, we have power. We have electricity, internet, everything. <laughs> Gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, so I thought maybe you could just kick us off by telling us a bit about what David's involvement at the social experiment at Rojava was like and, you know, what form did his support take? I, I guess um, I guess two things strike me about, about David's involvement here. Um, the first is that he, he was one of the first Western uh, writers um, of note to really, to really promote this place to explains to the world how important it was and, and not just like the military aspect of defeating Daesh and so on, but like to write about the the feminist led culture, the 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 power of ordinary people just to the empowerment of ordinary people o over a state, the way they did it and its importance for the world. Um, and the second thing that really struck me was was on a personal level how he had touched so many people here. I think he only came a couple of times and yet I've met probably half a dozen Kurds uh, since he since he died, who knew him and knew about him. People who had not been outside of Kurdistan in their entire lives, most of whom don't speak English, who say, "Oh yeah, I, I remember that guy." He, someone pointed out that he'd written the preface um, to to Abdul Ochlan's magnum opus in 2015, um, which is quite an, a major honour to give a, a Western writer, and so many just ordinary people who'd met him, who recognised his photo, um, and and most of the internationalists here, I think, if if they hadn't met him personally, knew his works intimately. Um, I was really struck when when I first arrived at the internationalist commune two years ago that everybody there knew him and had met him. Nearly everyone had met him at some point, um, and and spoke about him like a mate, like rather than this sort of great thinker that he was. Um, I was wondering if perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about this tradition of internationalist solidarity, uh, which both David and you were drawing from and what that meant to him. Uh, yeah, I think, I think one of the great, um, one of the reasons why this place has been so successful um, is, is because it's a fundamentally outward looking revolution. Um, ordinary people here, welcome internationals with open arms there's uh there's like a internationalism is like at, at the core of this revolution i i think i think david recognized that from from a very uh from a very early stage uh he he saw it i, th I think one of the most important things that he saw was that this was more than just a military battle and whilst uh, certainly around 2014 when he he first started writing um uh, popular articles about this place. Um, a lot of people were writing about the international volunteers in the YPG and the YPJ and the International Freedom Battalion. He was writing about 
the the civilian work that was going on he was drawing on his influences uh, his experiences from madagascar uh, uh, and his own um political understanding of of the economy that was being built um and he he also had a, a very similar outlook to Murray Bookchin, uh, who had uh, another uh, great Jewish philosopher from New York, who who had influenced massively Abdul Ochil and, and therefore influenced this place, um, and and recognised how important it was that that Ochiland had had drawn on internationalist ideas, had had been outward looking, but also tried to implement them in in a way that fitted the Middle East in this region. Danny, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been really wonderful hearing from you. Um, and best of luck with everything you're doing in Rajava. Um, our next speaker, uh, which is pretty good considering Danny just mentioned uh, Murray Bookchin, uh, is Debbie Bookchin, who will be speaking to us from New York. Uh, Debbie Bookchin is a journalist and author, co-editor of The Next Revolution, Popular Assemblies and The Promise of Direct Democracy. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ash. Thank you for having, for knitting together this beautiful tribute. And thanks to everybody at Novara for doing this. It's, I think, uh, very cathartic for many people all over the world and, and certainly for those of us who knew David. And it's interesting, you know, I think that my father and David actually shared a lot of, certainly a lot of different kinds of views and aspects of sort of, in, in the sense that both of them were free of the cant of traditional academia. I mean, my dad wasn't an academic at all, but even David as an anthropologist was so much more. He was also a political theorist and a historian and, and, and that sort of freedom allowed them really to um, develop social theory that that really saw the best in people. And I think one of the things that that was so important about Rojava for David, and that certainly would have been also for my father, had he lived to see Rojava, was that they there was a sense in which their belief in the potential of human beings to be the best that they can be was exhibited in this beautiful form of assembly democracy. And John, um, John McDonald mentioned this idea, this sort of this idea of this belief in people's goodness, which David had, and which he really exemplified himself. And that sense of belief in people's goodness also manifested itself in believing that people can chart their own futures and that what we can do is really have a world that is so much better, you know, than the one that we're afforded under capitalism. So, and the other thing that I think, you know, that reminds me of sort of a similarity is my dad used to say that one of his, that his favorite word was coherence. And I think that David also embodied that idea because as you know, and as others have said from his writing, he, he really made a project in a sense of making the world coherent and in a way that people could understand in a way that wasn't academic, that wasn't just purely for, for show, but because he really truly believed that we could take a largely irrational world and make it into a rational world. So, you know, especially these days when there's sort of a, an abundance of kind of, you could call it uninformed or sloppy thinking. I think David's work, his project was just so profoundly important and informed and, and so accessible to, to all of us and, and, and so readable, you know, as others have said. So I, 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 I guess, you know, again, it's I, I sort of like Molly said, it's hard, it's hard not to associate all of this, this project with who David was as a person. And sometimes he used to talk a little bit about his mom. And I often sort of thought that she must have played a big role in influencing David and who he, he was and that sense of optimism that he really did retain because he was just so full of life. And so, you know, David could have as much fun and he loved social, he's loved company, you know, good company. He, he could get as animated talking about, oh, you know, 
a whole, you know, I once asked him to recommend some Vietnamese restaurants. <laughs> work, right? He reeled off this list of Vietnamese restaurants. And not only there's a list of restaurants, but also like what was the best dish to order in. <laughs> And so you could be as animated about something like that as, as talking about why he had to take on, you know, anti-Semitism with respect to the Labor Party issue, you know. So he he delighted in new experiences. And most of all, again, you know, that optimism, it was truly, it was a deep feature of his personality. And, and you know, I feel like he almost sort of, he embodied that himself. It's sort of like he believed in the human spirit because he himself was mm -hmm. so human, you know? And he really felt that sort of that, that kind of brilliance of mind that he had was truly infused by this idea that, you know, if we could just overcome the burdens that capitalism and the state have placed on us, um, you know, that, that we could go, go forward and create a much more rational, in human society. I mean, there's a quality that you were talking about, which is the expansiveness of his writing, but also the precision, the lack of sloppiness. And the other thing you got me thinking about was um, uh, certainly for, on my part, his patience with my stupidity. You know, he met me as an 18, 19 year old and, you know, it's a process of politicization and I'm trying out ideas. And you could see him cock his head a little bit and just ask you questions to help you get somewhere but there wasn't irritability or impatience no. or dismissal no um, no he was actually i mean he once told me that sometimes that he got that it, it made him a little bit that he got sometimes almost mad at himself because he could be provoked by trolls on quit twitter you know <laughs> he said and he said something very funny he said you know i'm smart enough to know that i shouldn't react that way but not smart enough not to do it, you know? And it was <laughs> another sort of way in which he could be self-deprecating and just have a great sense of humor, you know? And and I think, oh, you know, I mean, Molly said it so beautifully, you know, he was so full of life, it's just sort of impossible to imagine a world without him um, because he, he literally um, exemplified the sort of, people of the future that we all really strive to become. And, and uh, I guess, you know, the only thing that we can do is, is take that vision forward and, and, and keep on, you know, keep on with the struggle. Thank you so much for joining us, Debbie, and sharing your memories of him. I think that's one of my favorite things about this stream. It's not just about his political contributions, his academic work, it's these little, the textures of what it was like to interact with him. And it's yes, lovely David, to hear it from you. He was, among other things, a great, great friend. He truly yeah. was. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we move on to our next speakers, just thought uh, I'd share a couple of comments from our YouTube stream. Uh, this from Zara Sir Ashraf, learning of David Graeber and reading Bullshit Jobs, the week I lost my bullshit job was the affirmation I never knew I needed. Thank you for the catharsis and rest in power, David. And from Adam, David Graeber made me an anarchist and I could never thank him enough for that. Well, Adam, I'm sure you are not alone there. I think now I want to talk a little bit about David's impact on the London left and his impact on us at Navarra. Um, I remember first meeting him, like I said, as an 18, 19 year old and his endless amounts of patience for me being wrong-headed and obtuse occasionally very very rarely um he had such a profound influence on us even before we'd even met him uh when we'd occupied our university at ucl in protest of the troubling of tuition fees uh direct action was kind of a handbook for all of us uh we'd learned how to do consensus decision making in the wavy hands and then suddenly when you met him it was almost like you'd met you know the person who invented the light bulb or something it was kind of bizarre and wonderful to meet this person who was so integral in shaping uh, your social infrastructure. So to seek us into our next section and our next speaker, we've got a clip of David speaking at an Occupy London protest in Parliament Square back in April of 2012. 
You know, the amazing thing is if you actually look at the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, it doesn't say anything about America being a democracy. Uh, no one ever talks about this. Um, and if you look at it, you know, and you, you figure out why, you read the original documents, you realize that actually those guys hated democracy. They said so all the time. Um, you know, I actually saw the opening speech of the Constitutional Convention where uh, the you know people gathered together to create the American Constitution. And the first speech is by uh, Governor of Virginia. He says, we've got a real problem in this country. There's a real danger of democracy breaking out. Um, there's democratic <laughs> elements in a lot of the local constitutions. We've got to do something about this. What are we going to do to prevent democracy? We need to create a federal system, you know, so forth and so on. So the entire constitutional project is an attempt explicitly to suppress democracy. Uh, now, what do they mean by democracy? Well, they meant this. They meant people sitting around in squares, publicly discussing what to do and brainstorming ideas and, and resolving their own problems in an equal fashion. And why were they against it? They said very blatantly. I mean, John Adams, um, who was, I think, the third president, uh, uh, wrote, said, well, one man, one vote? Well, that, that's insane. You can't have democracy. We have, you know, we have like 10 million people with no property and 1 million people with property. What do you think is going to happen if you give these guys the vote? Um, you know, they're going you know, to appropriate us right away. Um, so they made very clear that there is no way you can have real democracy if, you know, uh, if you have vast inequalities of wealth without people actually, taking, you know, undoing the great inequalities of wealth. Now, what they have done over the last 200 years is figure out a way, A, to take these institutions which were basically created to stop democracy and convince everybody they are democracy, and B, to like um, get people more and more involved in the system, since uh, gradually they did expand it to one man, one vote, and still somehow not have them do the thing everybody was afraid that they were going to do in the beginning, which is expropriate the wealth. Uh, it's been one of the, you know, I mean, millions and millions of very ingenious people have been working on how to do this for years. It's one of the greatest feats of propaganda ever done, but it's ultimately backed up by force. And the moment you really seriously challenge it, well, we all see what happens. So our next speaker is somebody who needs very little introduction, considering uh, many of you will be familiar with his work and his presence on Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. Welcome to the stream. Hi, Ash. How are you doing? I'm well, I'm well. I mean, David Graeber really was one of the spiritual godfathers of Navarra. I think him, along with Mark Fisher, was so central mm. to shaping our thinking. We just, we wouldn't exist without him. So I was hoping that you could talk a bit about his contribution and his influence. Yeah, it's immense. Um, if I think of the kind of big Anglophone speakers in the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis, you know, there weren't many people to hand. I think capitalist realism with all, with all due respect to Mark Fisher, Mark was an outstanding thinker, but capitalist realism was like a was like an intellectual bomb going off. It was an event. Uh, but with with David Graeber, you know, he had multiple. I mean, and I'm sure Mark would have as well. But David made those interventions. It's very rare, by the way, for an intellectual to do that. There was debt before 2000. You know, eight. There was the um, fragments of an anarchist anthropology. Uh, there was bullshit jobs. You know, normally. I think it has one act, right? He had three, four, five, and you know, even at the age of 59, he squeezed so much in. Uh, but it was debt, which really, uh, as, you've, as, you, as you've talked about already on this broadcast, which really shaped a lot of um, incipient embryonic thinking in the immediate aftermath of first 2008 and then, and then 2010. Uh, and I remember meeting him for the first time. I think you were probably there too. It was at uh, an occupation in a, in a London, uh, it was effectively a squat. It wasn't actually an active university building <laughs> by the people that were occupying it. And um, and we were talking about debt, you know, people saying, well, it's all about, you know, creating the debtor subject. And we're seeing this, by the way, right now, playing out in universities across the country. Uh, and David gave us the intellectual tools to understand this. The, one, of the, one of the reasons we're sending young people to higher education isn't to teach them skills to, to go and add value in, the, in a, in a ca capitalist market economy. It's about cultivating a debtor subject who gets used to being in debt their entire lives and is creating value through interest to other people, whether it's through their university degree, whether it's through their financialized student housing. We're seeing this all out play, play out right now. But we were having those conversations in 2010, 11, trying to make sense of it because nobody had really done that yet. You know, debt hadn't been published. And David's voice just comes out of nowhere saying, well, you know, I'm I, I'm writing a book about that, actually. 
And nobody, nobody, you know, and about an hour or two later after the thing's finished, somebody goes, that's, that's David Graeber. And I'm like, come on, you're kidding me. And it's, <laughs> it, it's very rare. We just saw him sort of shouting in, in Parliament Square. It's very rare for the, for the person shouting in Parliament Square to be one of the most lucid human beings on the planet, right? Which, which is what he did. You know, he, he, he had the ability to distill an idea in such a way. And John, John McDonald talked about it earlier. Sometimes it was such a powerful provocation. It would probably take you 24 hours on an unconscious level and you'd sort of be walking around the next day or taking a shower and you go, wow, actually, yeah, that, that really makes sense of something which I, I'd, I'd grasped previously, but I hadn't really understood the intricacies of it properly. And David was a master at that. You know, and there are very few thinkers like David, you know, in our day and age who do it almost on a, on a quotidian basis. He was, he was behaving like that. So... From your perspective as someone who's making interventions in a media context, what are the ideas that David has generated which have had the biggest impact on popular politics? So not the marginal stuff, the stuff which is right at the heart of a national and international conversation. Yeah, I think debt and bullshit jobs are the two big ones. And I think debt, you know, we again, we can't stress this enough. With debt, first 5,000 years, the history of debt that he writes, I think it's published in 2011. David gives the post-2008 left, which is increasingly, you know, socialist. You know, that it has anarchist elements, it has Marxist elements, radical social democratic elements. You know, if I think about another big Anglophone thinker that shapes the present moment, probably David Harvey, his video lectures about Marx, you know. Uh, but what David does uniquely, David Harvey doesn't do that. Uh, Mark Fisher doesn't do that. Uh, you know, Angela Davis doesn't do that. He offers us this incredible framework around debt uh, and how we can understand it as a, as, a, as a particular nexus through which capital exploits us in our everyday lives. And what David does is he says we're faced with this financialized form of capitalism, which, you know, the primary nexus isn't just necessarily uh, the primary nexus of exploitation isn't just work. It's also this other thing. Uh, with financialization, with debt, with loans, with credit. But he also says it's also not entirely new. And he contextualizes that within that, that broader ethnographic framework, which he provides over 5,000 years. And, and so I think it's with debt, which David, um, David changes the course of intellectual history with, with debt. You know, he, 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 again, it's the most powerful ideas aren't something nobody's ever thought before. It's something which everybody is confronting all the time. And yet, he names it, he gives an explanation for it, he contextualizes it, and he does it in the most incredibly everyday language. Uh, and that's the wonderful thing with David. You know, it wasn't some uh, complex theoretical framework which somebody had to translate 20 years later. And that's often the way with these kind of explosive, you know, breakthroughs with Foucault, with mm. Marx, right? Uh, with a Silvia Federici. That stuff ten tends to be translated. It takes a long time to percolate through to the to the popular culture. That didn't happen with David and, and mm. Depp because, you know, he had this tremendous idiom. And if it wasn't the book you you read, it was a YouTube video. It was mm. in Navarre. It was an event. He had incredible capacity to talk in very comprehensible terms. Well, I think the next thing we're going to be talking about is one of those very comprehensible terms. We're going to be moving on to talking about bullshit jobs. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. My Great pleasure. to see you as ever. Thank you. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys can hear on my microphone, but my neighbours are having an absolute rager of a party, which I feel David would have uh, definitely approved of. So uh, apologies for the noise, but it's the best tribute I can think of. Um, after his work on debt, uh, David Graeber's most well-known work is probably Bullshit Jobs. And at its heart, which is, you know, a phenomenal intervention, uh, is a very simple idea. And the idea is that if 40% of the workforce believe their jobs are pointless, which according to polling they do, we should probably just take their word for it. And in this next clip, David explains at the RSA the political significance of his theory of Bullshit Jobs. One reason that I wrote this book, you know, I'm, I'm a anti-capitalist anarchist personally. I've been involved in direct action movements for a long time, and um, 
And it always seems to me that capitalism is being held together more by moral arguments than anything else at this point, because most of the old practical arguments don't really apply. You know, for the last 50 years, you just said, well, you know, capitalism creates great inequality, but at least, you know, it lifts all boats, and uh, even poor people know their children will be doing better off in the next generation, and nobody believes that anymore. That's not, obviously not true. Um, the other argument was it creates a big, strong middle class, and that leads to political stability, and that's clearly not the case. Um, the other one was technological, you know, well, it, we're all going to be on Jupiter in a few years, uh, there's going to be en endless inventions, capitalism is a huge engine for creativity, and, you know, instead we just get, like, iPhone 7, iPhone 8, uh, but, um, you know, all the sci-fi stuff just, it used to happen, but capitalism seemed to stop producing that stuff all of a sudden. Um, so none of those things are true. So in a large way, I think the only two arguments left are, well, anything else would be worse. You know, it's us or North Korea, basically. Uh, and the other argument is, well, it's basically moral. It's just like people really do believe that if you don't pay your debts, you're a bad person. I mean, unless you're rich, in which case it doesn't matter somehow. All right, so, so debt is one thing. And um, the other one is, is, is work. Oh, they really seem to have convinced people that if you aren't working harder than you want to be working at something you don't particularly enjoy, uh, preferably under the orders of somebody you don't like, um, then you're just a bad person. You know, you don't deserve help. You don't deserve relief. There, no one should love you. you know? um, and, and how that happened is one of the things I've tried to investigate over the course of the book. And so to discuss his work on bullshit jobs with us as journalist, uh, author, and general policy wonker the left, Grace Blakely. Thanks for that intro. <laughs> well, I think it's accurate. You, no, if it's you need nice. someone to write your CV. I might put it on my CV, yeah. <laughs> bullshit job I do or don't apply to. Actually, it's like... The first time I met David, he gave me a copy of Bullshit Jobs, which is hilarious. I remember I met him actually like I was kind of on a date and um, it was at this pub and he was there. I'm pretty sure like this was a, a preconceived meeting and like the guy I was dating, I was still dating, took me there to try and impress me. Um, and there's David Graeber and I'm like, oh my God, it's David Graeber, this is so cool. And um, he's just like the most chill, relaxed guy. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, I, I was chatting to him about, about debt. And he's like, oh yeah, I've just written this new book. Why don't you have a read? And it was Bullshit Jobs. And obviously it's, you know, so fantastic. It's one of those books where I've actually given it to like so many of my like family, normal friends, many of whom are very much trapped in BS jobs. Um, and I think his whole... You know his insights he always you know the way that he worked was always to like look at the world with these new eyes and just ask these questions right so like why do we have to why do we feel like we have to repay our debts why do we get up and go to work every day in jobs that are unfulfilling and that don't contribute anything to the world um you know why are all the this was a great one um with flying cars and the falling rate of profit um why are all the things that i saw in sci-fi shows as a kid why haven't like a load of them been invented when the generation before a load of the things that they imagined in sci-fi had been invented like these amazing fantastical questions that would just push you down so many different avenues and i think that kind of creativity and his just deep understanding of the incredible things that human beings can produce and can create together when they're freed from these kind of structures um, that are imposed upon them was so clear in Bullshit Jobs because it was so obviously this rallying cry to all these people who were just like daily exploited and oppressed and told and believed because it was replicated in their reality, another world is not possible. It actually is. It was one of the reasons why I was like, right, I'm I'm quitting my actual job and, you know, going to become a writer full time, um, which I think was a, a very good decision. Um, and it certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, that that a lot of David's writing is what frees you from this idea, this like voice in the back of your head that's like, right, OK, you need to be being productive every second of your day. You need to be you know, sitting down at your desk, working, you need to be suffering, right? David wasn't like that. He was like, you need to be playing. 
because playing <laughs> is where the creativity comes from. Playing is where, you know, the joy and the ideas come from. Um, and he was, yeah, I mean, that, that came through in who he was as a person, but also throughout all of his work. I think um, there's an interview that he did with James Butler, where he says, play is the ultimate expression of freedom in the known universe, which I've always loved. Mm. Um, but a question I'd, I'd really love to hear you address is, do you think that this idea of bullshit jobs has an extra resonance and salience because of coronavirus? Oh, absolutely. Like, there's absolutely no question about that. I mean, both of, you know, so, I mean, I suppose there's two major contributions that most people will be familiar with will be around debt and about um, bullshit jobs. There are also other things. So, you know, those the essays he started writing about the revolt of the caring classes. And also, I think that other essay, um, Blind Cars and the Falling Rate of Profit, is really, really interesting from a kind of, um, you know, economics and technological perspective. But those two main ideas around debt and around work, they are just so central to how we are going to redesign our society in the wake of this crash and we will obviously redesign our society in the wake of this crash it's just that if working people don't band together and demand a different way of doing things it will be redesigned to further the interests of the ruling classes um so you can imagine right so this um shift towards home working has within it um, the seeds of both kind of freedom and renewed oppression. Because if you can go work from home, you're freed from your commute, you potentially have more time for yourself. Um, you potentially have more time to kind of be creative, to do things that aren't just like kind of answering emails all the time, being pulled into meetings, whatever. But it also has the seeds of a kind of renewed form of oppression because um, you know, there are all sorts of new ways that employers will come up with to monitor you while you're at home. There are all sorts of ways and technologies that will be developed in order to um you know pierce more areas of your life and colonize more areas of your life so that that the distinction between work and leisure is eroded entirely right um, so there are these two kind of potential views of the world and i think you know it's it's uh, it's similar with debt this crisis is as bad as it is because of the huge amounts of debt that had um built up in the system prior to uh, the pandemic so corporate debt personal debt debt sovereign debt in the global south and we have these two futures, right? One is a kind of revived feudalism where these debts that cannot and probably will never be repaid are just extracted um, from the, the you know, current labor um, of people for you know, many, many years to come. Or we think you know, maybe this is a time for a new global debt write-off. Maybe this is the time to think about restructuring all this personal debt that's become such a drag on the economy. So I think, you know, these ideas are so, so, so important. And the ideas themselves, obviously, you know, we need to be thinking about very, very clearly, but also the way that David approached telling us about them, right? Um, and the quote that always sticks out to me, the one that I always, uh, that I love so much from him, is the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something we make and could just as easily make differently. And I think right now, that is the kind of hope that we have to cling on to. It's so hard with, I mean, you know, people on the left, we are dispersed. It is difficult to come together and um, have all the discussions that we would ordinarily want to be having at this incredibly difficult time. Um, but as long as we have the capacity to imagine that things could be different, we will ultimately find the power to make that a reality. I have, I have real faith in that. Um, you know, David was such an optimist about, uh, about our capacity to make the world differently. And I am a, a complete, like him, I'm such an optimist, even in the face of what looks like from the outset, if you look at it from a purely materialist perspective, you would think is just constant and unerring, uh, of, you know, oppression and, um, and a world that just seems impossible to make any different. Um, I think, yeah, so his ideas, but also his firm belief that we can, we can make the world differently. I mean, I think his refusal to embrace nihilism is for me like one of the greatest yeah. gifts that he gave to the people around him. Um, Grace, thank you so much for joining us in the stream tonight. Good to see you as ever. Thank um, you. you too. Lovely to hear from you. Um, so before we move on, just want to share a couple more comments from the YouTube stream. This from Leon Hart Music. His lecture with David Wengro at the Radical Anthropology Group in London on Paleolithic politics is the first time I came across David. He blew me away. It is wonderful and still available. Rest in peace. Thanks. And this is from Sergei Kvatov. Found out about David only this summer and spent all summer reading his works. Absolute masterpieces. Right you are, Sergei. 
And to introduce our next section, I just want to very briefly go back to that talk at the RSA where David gives a typically irreverent and I think tongue in cheek explanation of how he ended up in academia. Though I'm going to check with our next guest whether he was actually joking or not. Michael Hudson actually made the argument that, you know, 30 years ago, rich people discovered that poor people actually feel they should pay their debts, um, which had never occurred to them because they don't, right? Um, it's true. I mean, I, I, people ask me why I'm a professor. You know, they say, why don't you become a writer? You, you know, it would be more fun. You'd set your own hours. You wouldn't have to do all this admin work. And I always say, well, you know, there's, there's one thing about academia which isn't true of being a musician, being an artist, being a writer, any of those things, which is they never, ever pretend they just forgot to pay you. <laughs> Every month, there it is, like clockwork, you know, and anything, like, you know, where they have any excuse not to pay their debt to you, they won't do it. Um, I mean, it's just amazing. That's why we have agents, you know, I can tell you stories. <laughs> so our next guest is Alpa Shah, who is an associate professor reader in anthropology at LSC. Uh, she's the author of Night March Among India's Revolutionary Guerrillas, which was shortlisted for the 2019 World Prize for Political Writing. Alpa, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ash, for having us and all the other guests. It's such a beautiful, wonderful tribute um, to David. I've been watching it from the beginning. I've done a, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, I mean, it was, uh, I'll tell you guys a secret, it was Michael Walker from Navarre who put in a lot of the grunt work in the hard yards for this evening's event. So I was just wondering if you could tell us, was David joking when he said he got into academia because it's a more stable paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. And I, I just, you know, seeing that right now, it reminded me of his arguments about basic income, which is basically that, you know, he was such a supporter and promoter of basic income. And, and because he was arguing that, this is what's going to enable another better world, you know, where we all, where we don't have to think about um, everyday life, where the money's going to come from. That's where we're going to be able to, when we're going to be able to imagine creating a different world. And I, I, I had never, of course, it hadn't, it hadn't clicked that actually, yeah, that is why, uh, you know, having that regular paycheck from academia was important because I often used to think, or, you know, say to him, David, I think maybe it's about time you just stop drawing that LSE salary because, you know, academia can be so infuriatingly um, frustrating too and it certainly was for David um, you know he had this like very um, conflicting relationship with academia I guess as many of us do uh, you know he hated its racism he hated its elitism he hated its bureaucracy and he was always you know trying to subvert it um, in different kinds of ways I guess um, he he you know he did um, those classic tactics of foot dragging where, you know, he just not turn up to meetings, which he thought <laughs> was bureaucratic. He'd, um, he'd uh, yeah, he, well, or he did, he did, um, uh, you know, like his lectures, they never stuck to the regular format. They always, yeah, of course, you know, flowed into the streets, um, the corridors and the streets. He'd, um, yeah, he'd not do the paperwork uh, until the very last minute or not, you know, try not to do it at all. Um, um, but he also did all these, you know, very more proactive things, of course, like supporting students, um, uh, supporting, you know, the, the, the cleaner strikes that we had, or any of the teach outs for st doing strike action. Uh, and then he was always, you know, doing this kind of parody uh, the whole time, as you said at the beginning, Ash, you know, he was so, um, he was so mischievous, you know, he was always having fun. Uh, you'll, you'll recall his, um, you know, he, I don't know what he was dressed in when you met him, but he, he at some point in my, in the time that I knew him, I think it was, uh, I, I mean, I've known him since he, he, when he left Yale, he came over to Goldsmiths where I was and 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 I think that was 2007 and, and at some point we we both moved moved over to the LSC uh, in 2013 and he started wearing uh, yeah he started wearing a waistcoat and you know uh, a, a non-iron shirt but a shirt <laughs> nevertheless <laughs> um, uh, yeah had a pocket watch and you know was wearing tweeds and you know this was all kind of parody you know he was like dressing as an aristocrat he was just you know he was having fun um, 
But yeah, his real passion, really, I think um, what that clip doesn't get at is his real passion in academia was anthropology. Um, so this is not the anthropology of, you know, research evaluation frameworks or promotion criteria or writing for, you know, journals or in, in which you hide behind a language that only uh, other people, a small group of people will understand or at least pretend they understand. Um, but the anthropology that really opened up the human imagination, you know, that question the inequalities in the world that we live in and to show that another world is possible you know it's a, it's um uh, this was the anthropology you know that um studied the trobriand islanders of melanesia or the pera of um of amazonia or the tiv of uh, africa and showed us that institutions like the state, the market, um, you know, these these institutions didn't exist any, any, everywhere. Male dominance what, what didn't exist everywhere. They, they, they weren't inevitable um, that, you know, we could have a world in which it was possible uh, to live without these inequalities and that we'd all be better off as a, as a result of it. So David, um, I think what he was doing for David academia and anthropology, um, what he was doing there was he was really waging a war of the imagination. And, you know, he, he said, he said that actually there's, a, there's been this war of imagination that's been going on for years, but it's been, you know, won by the capitalist classes. And his project was really to, to find in other societies a different way of living in the world that could challenge, you know, that could challenge that. And uh, yeah, that took him to Madagascar, um, and you know that's how that's what his work in Madagascar was about. You know, he he saw these spaces of people living. Um, you know, they had to fill out all these tax forms, um, but actually they never paid their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> he he debt. We've talked a lot about debt, and you know, um, John McDonnell was talking about him and being in an anarchist anthropology and the debt. You know, the debt jubilees. I mean, all of that really comes from his anthropology because what he was doing is he was re, re he was reading rereading the work of other scholars. So, um, uh, for example, um, Marcel Moss, uh, who was this French anthropologist, uh, the guy who probably you know made made French anthropology in a sense. He wrote this uh, history. Um, he wrote this essay on the gift and what he was arguing was basically that in tribal societies they weren't based on barter as we've been led to believe that they've they were gift societies everyone was constantly indebted to each other and this was just the norm uh, you know no one would ever think about calling in your debts and so he was reclaiming like from from anthropology you know from from the tribal societies as as put to us by Marcel Mauss, for example, another way of thinking about, you know, current the current debt crisis that we that we have, and this was so kind of so absolutely amazing uh, about him. I mean, there's a question that I've been uh, dying to ask you because the two of you have got this um, commonality, which is you both write about insurrectionist movements, and you do it without sensationalism, you do it without, you know, sexing up the militancy. And in David's writing, it's suffused with a sort of warmth and a sort of joy and a clear investment in what he's talking about, but in a way that doesn't undermine his rigor. And so I was hoping that you could talk a bit about doing this kind of anthropological work where you're dealing with political movements that you feel an investment in because you are similarly invested in the overturning of the status quo. Yeah, I mean, um, David was, um, you know, one of the wonderful things about him was that, you know, he, he um, the personal was never separate from the political or the professional. So his his academy, his anthropology was never just for for anthropology. He 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 supported so many projects as we've heard. He supported you know movements in it, whether it was a Kurdish movement, whether it was Occupy, um, whether it was basic income. His anthropology was never just for the classroom. Um, and in doing this, he, um, yeah, he, he, his involvement in in various movements was actually also about opening up the spaces in academia itself, as it should be, to making it a much more kind of democratic 
place, he was making sure that what we did in academia became much more accessible. Uh, so through his writings, you know, a lot of us get so much inspiration from his writings, the way he wrote, um, uh, especially, you know, um, uh, apart from the fact, you know, about what he was writing about and the projects he became in engaged in, he was showing, um, why it was important for 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 all of us, you know, to be engaged in subjects like um, well, in academia, in some subjects like anthropology, not all, you know, for in in order to create uh, to create a better world. So I think yeah, his kind of commitment to 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 social movements, to insurrectionist politics, was never separate from his. Um, from his academic work, and that was been really, really important in in academia more broadly, and and for me personally, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, he created a huge space. I mean, I was working with a much more, I mean, a Marxist, Leninist, <laughs> Maoist inspired movement, which is almost a kind of relic of the past, you know, um, and you know they were stuck, they were stuck in 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 their kind of vanguardism, in in their relationship to violence. In um, in their analysis of the economy, you know, it was it was all from a different era. And when I came back from fieldwork, I was completely lost. You know, I was utterly I was utterly devastated because when you do the kind of anthropological fieldwork that David and I are trained in, you you live with the people that you're working with, and you kind of almost become one of them. Mm. And you know, you have to extract yourself out of that um, when you're writing and and when you're analyzing. And and for me, um, you know, I was totally drowned in, in in this movement. But David was there. You know, he was across the Gora corridor at, at Goldsmiths. And slowly over over the over the years, he helped me think about how a different world could be possible, both through his writings, but also through, you know, how he lived in academia, <laughs> the spaces he created up, how he opened it up. You know. Um, and and um, yeah, that's just a huge, huge. You know, we all owe him so much. It's a, so such huge debt uh, that he's that we have to him. Of course, he will say it's not a. Yeah, debt. he would never call it that. It's a gift. You know, of course, it's a gift or a debt that should never be paid back. Yeah. Well, Alpa, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your reflections on his academic work and uh, what it was like to to work alongside him. Um, it's really incredible to hear from you. Our next section is about this kind of mystery still about how an anarchist like David Graeber became so invested in the cause of labor and the cause of Corbynism in particular. And I think our next speaker is very well placed to help open that up. But just before we get to him, here's a clip of David speaking at The World Transformed in 2018 about why he was so enthusiastic about the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Preserving a space, the prefigurative space, where you're not in any way dependent on funding or political power mm -hmm. is absolutely essential to what we're doing. On the other hand, if we have, do not form any alliances with the parliamentary left, then we're screwed too. Um, I mean, one thing I find so inspiring about the UK is that you know, the the mainstream left, well, not the mainstream left. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean the Blairites aren't left at all. So yeah, um, in a way, Corbyn's become the mainstream left. The, the institutional left here actually understands that you don't want to co-opt, um, you don't want to simply absorb the extra parliamentary left. You need to have people who are completely independent of you, creating those prefigured spaces, opening up horizons and territories that maybe they can later move into. Um, also, you know, that just make them seem more moderate in comparison. I mean, the right wing has always understood this. That's mm -hmm. why the right is doing so well in America. I used to yell at liberals so much, and then, you know, it's like, don't you understand? Like, you can't actually screw over your radicals on policy issues if you already screw them over on existential <laughs> issues. <laughs> you know, so, it's true. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah, the right, like, you know, of course they're going to screw over their radicals on policy issues, but, like, they want them to be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if, if the left in America was as religious about the First Amendment as the right is about the Second Amendment, Occupy would still mm -hmm. be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, politics would look totally different. So, so, you know, here we have people who understand that. But they don't want to absorb the extra uh, the extra parliamentary left. And, you know, speaking as someone who is an anarchist and does 
feels that it's absolutely critical that there be an autonomous extra-parliamentary mm -hmm. left that finds some way of complementarily working with people who are working within the system, I find that inspiring and, and, and incredibly, an incredible relief. However, you know, there is the danger that at one point I actually had someone call me from the Corbin camp and suggest that I write an, um, an op-ed, um, opinion piece, calling on people to stop waiting on Corbyn. Um, calling on people to stop waiting on Corbyn. The irony is, is that we have a few troubles getting our last guest on, but in the meantime, I promise he'll be worth the wait. Uh, let's go to some of the comments that we've had from you guys on our YouTube stream. This from Jules T.I. Hope to live long enough to see Wall Street slash capitalism go up in flames. Thanks, David. That's a very uh, graber uh, bit of optimism there. Maybe the world will go up in flames first. Um, I think he'd be annoyed at me if uh, he heard me being so pessimistic. Um, one of the things that was always really wonderful uh, to hear from David is that he had this faith that even in some of the most darkest uh, political moments where the forces of reaction feel, seem poised to snuff you out is that there's always a kind of you know unquashable note of resistance and it's here this kind of lived everyday resistance where you can see the seeds of you know more communist and more empathetic and more loving kind of society there are these acts of everyday kindness everyday uh frustrating of the system uh which show you that uh wall street capitalism all of it it's not inevitable um it can and it will uh depart this earth um just waiting for a couple more comments to make their appearance uh this from uh rishi Oh, wow. Rishi Sunak. Uh, literally all of David Graeber's work is worth checking out. Please do so, folks. I wish you all a great existence. Going to guess not the real Rishi. Um, also, uh, just a note to check out uh, Nika Dubrovsky's and David's Patreon. Uh, Nika has tweeted about her future plans. This is a good point at which to remind you all that David's wife, Nika Dubrovsky, has got plans for a carnival celebrating his life on October the 11th. If you go to davidgraber.industries, you can find all of the information that you need, but it will be a series of online and also real life events across multiple countries, cities, and places. Um, I think that it would be a real testament to his memory to get the left back together in a moment of joy and celebration, uh, as long as it's two meters apart, of course, um, because that's exactly the kind of space where David himself was happiest. Um, this comment from Jan uh, Zuppinger, thank you so much for this wonderful tribute to David. He was such an inspiration, a trickster, a free spirit, a mensch, rest in power. Uh, one of the things that uh, we didn't really talk about so much today was the way in which David considered himself part of an intellectual Jewish tradition of people who pitched themselves against the establishment, who confounded uh, dominant forms of common sense and ways of thinking. They thought of himself very much in the tradition of Spinoza and of Marx. Um, maybe if we do another kind of retrospective on David's work, we can think about how his very particular form of Jewishness impacted his work and his thinking. So I've just been informed that our final guest is ready for us. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, former leader of the Labour Party, uh, Islington North MP and all round good egg. Welcome to the stream. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I've had some technical problems getting onto the, uh, onto the system, but we're here now. Worth the wait, worth the wait. So Jeremy, hopefully you can help me solve this mystery of how an anarchist like David Graeber became one of your most fierce supporters as an individual, but also the set of policies which you spearheaded over the five years of your leadership. Well, he was a very organized anarchist. <laughs> and so I think um, anarchism has a, an interesting name. 
in that a lot of people simply don't understand what's meant by it. And what David saw, I believe, was anarchism as empowerment of people at the um, most community level and at a level in which they can be effective. And the anarchist tradition, which goes back to Peter Kropotkin and many others, was actually about that. And um, there's an awful lot of lazy journalists in Britain who just describe um, anything that doesn't work as anarchy uh, without ever thinking about the whole tradition surrounding it. And I think what David was doing was um, taking forward the policy ideas that we developed from 2015 onwards on um, economic empowerment of left behind communities, on empowerment of students, and by empowering people in communities to develop a green industrial revolution. He saw in the direction of travel of what we're doing something of the kind of society he would quite like to live in. And um, David became a very trenchant defender and supporter of us, and I will be forever grateful to him for that. And um, I was talking to Nika last night, his widow, and... Um, they were discussing his um, performance as a lecturer in Goldsmiths College. And uh, apparently it was sort of unprecedented numbers of students wanted to come to his lectures. So there would be a queue assembling early to get in and get a seat at a lecture. A bit like some of our rallies during the 2015 election when people would be queuing up for two hours before in order to get in because they wanted to be part of something. And they saw in David something very, very interesting, exciting, and actually very deeply intellectual. But like all the best intellectuals, he was popular and was able to express his views in a popular way and challenge power. Hence, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy in the city of London, and the way in which he was able to, in a few words, describe the power structures that work against people, the way in which finance capital can destroy a small business at the stroke of a pen or the tap of a computer button. And um, those people that have spent their lives manufacturing things that are useful suddenly find that they're not of any value anymore because finance capital is not interested in them. David understood all of that. And I, I think um, there's a huge amount that we can learn from his life, but also just reflect on the terrible tragedy of his death. I mean, could you, um, at such a young age, could you um, maybe tell us a bit about what it is you learned from his work and how it is you came across him? <clears throat> well, I came across him through um, Occupy, through his written work and through the influence that he um, um, had on people's thinking in the development of economic policy and strategy. And he was uh, uh, very close to John and was, I think very mm -hmm. pleased at the idea of the economic conferences that we held all over the country as a way of encouraging and mobilizing people. But uh, as you were saying, just as um, I tuned into the call, he was a Jewish intellectual. He was proud of being a Jewish man and a Jewish intellectual. And he came from that incredible Jewish tradition of learning, of education, of sharing and support for others. And that was what his whole being was about. And I was just looking the other day at a, um, a piece he recorded to camera um, in support and defense of uh, what we are and what we're about, an anti-racist party, an anti-racist organization, and uh, an anti-racist leadership of the party in every respect. So one of the things that you and David both have in common is this real interest in the radical political movements of the global south. For him, that's where a lot of his political education came from. And I know yeah. that that's been a really important influence in your life. I was just wondering if you could touch on that a bit, the internationalist dimensions of both what you have worked on and stood for all your life and also David's interests. Yeah, we live in a world that is 
obviously very deeply divided between the richest and the poorest, that we know, the richest and the poorest within our own society, and the richest and poorest at a global level. And the uh, Corona-19 has exposed that uh, big time. Uh, but it also has led people to sort of think about why are countries in the global south so poor? Why is the standard of living in most of sub-Saharan Africa for most of the population well below the standard of living in Europe or North America taken as an average? You then have to look at the colonial past. You have to look at an economic um, pattern, which is one of extractive industries rather than manufacturing industries, which is extractive agriculture rather than sustainable agriculture. And that impoverishment continues. And uh, I find the way that we study the history of um, post-colonial societies sadly wanting. One has to look at the dreams that were there when Ghana became independent in 1957, the first British colony to become independent after India, first African colony. The hopes there of developing a strong economy, including an industrial base and all that which Nkrumah wanted, the way in which they borrowed money or were forced to borrow money, and then the way in which the oil price crisis of the 1970s absolutely hit the poorest countries in the world and all the development economics was hit on the head by this massive increase in oil prices and they were then forced to go cap in hand elsewhere to try and borrow money and the debt crisis got worse and worse and worse and is still there and many countries are spending probably more on uh, debt sustaining than they receive in um, aid from other countries. Fair trade and debt write-off would do more good for the poverty of the global south than almost anything else. So one of the things that pretty much every speaker on this call has said is that David, even the darkest of political moments, had this unquashable optimism this faith in humanity and human potential and i was well, wondering this is what David and I were at one we both yeah. believe in hope we both yeah. believe in optimism there is there is no final victory there is no final defeat there are ups and downs along the way there are bumpy there are bumpy bits of the road there are bits of the railway that are not properly maintained but at the end of the day if we want to live in a fairer society a socialist society you have to campaign for it all the time and you have to take people with you didactic instructions to people never work it's about the empowerment of people now i remember when occupy started I, to be quite honest i was a bit puzzled by it but i, I went down to St paul's outside because i couldn't quite understand um, exactly what they were trying to do so I went down there and I just stood around, sat around and listened to a lot of people. And what it was, a lot of people who felt disempowered, felt quite angry, felt that there was a completely unaccountable financial power in the city of London that was actually dominating their lives, dominating their communities, destroying their jobs and industries and, and hopes. And um, this was a way of a popular movement getting up and saying something about it. And the same thing happened in Wall Street as happened in London and in other places. And all those people that turned up for all those workshops and talks and things, and I went to quite a lot of them, they'll remember that and they would have learned from that because education is, yes, what we get in school, what we get in the lectures and so on, but it's actually life experience is the best form of education. I think David did that in spades because somebody who was such a great lecturer as him, such a great thinker, such a larger than life, very funny, very witty character who didn't sort of fit into the stereotype of... Um, Socialists who are uh, very austere, quite boring, and very serious about themselves. People like me, for example, um, <laughs> they were actually larger than life characters that were prepared to encompass the life experience of others. Because if socialist ideas are to become more, even more popular than they are, they're very popular at the moment, then we have to go to people where they are 
listen to what they have to say and work with them to try and come through it and say, well, the solution to your problems isn't to create a ladder for success for the individual, is to create a movement of creativity for all of us to improve our lot. A tide that can lift all boats. Indeed. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your memories of David and your thoughts about his work. It has been wonderful mm -hmm. to And we're hear doing a, an event on the 11th of October, as I understand it, and I'm looking forward to that because it's going to be partly around, as I understand it, around Portobello Road, where he lived. And um, David's huge array of friends, which extend from people in the banking community to the people who are homeless and victims of what the banking system has done in many ways showed what a wonderful character he was and so in david we've lost a gem but we've put something in our hearts which is his optimism i share his optimism absolutely there's always hope there's always hope and i think of all the things i learned from david and i had the real privilege of having met him when I was quite young, it was that irrepressible faith in what people can do when they get together. And so I will encourage everyone to come to the carnival celebrating David's life uh, on October the 11th. There are events in London, Portobello Road, but also in other countries as well. If you go to davidgraber.industries, you will be able to find them. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy Corbyn, for joining us on this call. You're a very busy man, but you made time for us. And it's a pleasure. I'm sorry it was a bit nip and, nip and tuck getting here, but we did it in the end. Oh, look, it's... The left is held together on spit and string. That's nothing new for us. Uh, but, but I've been doing it for years. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank so you. much, Jeremy. And I'd just like to thank everyone who has spoken on this stream for sharing their memories, their reflections on David's work. Um, it's been a real pleasure to uh, just sit and listen never mind uh, host and facilitate this event. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who has uh, been watching on YouTube. Um, you, the fact that you're here and you're forming part of this community through which David's work can live on, I think is one of the greatest testaments to a life well lived that anyone could ever hope for. Um, we're going to wrap up here tonight. We have been Navara Media, and we're just going to leave you with this. Our final clip is David Graeber in conversation with our very own James Butler just last year. Why not, instead of the terms production and consumption, which have dominated political economy in the 20th century, we th substitute caring and freedom? Um, why not... Um, you know, caring labor could then be defined as labor which is primarily aimed at maintaining or augmenting another person's freedom. I mean, obviously, other things as well. But, you know, it might keep you alive, but obviously you're not very free if you're not alive. Uh, but, but it's important because, you know, if you just say it's about, like, keeping people alive and healthy and basically um, taking care of their basic needs, well, why isn't a prison a caring institution? You know, right? they just do that. They just do it in a nasty way, and they, they give you no freedom at all. So, so, so um, I think that if you think about the paradigm of caring labor is always a mother taking care of a child. Well, a mother takes care of a child so that child can grow and thrive, of course, but on the immediate level, you know, what are they doing right now to, to, to facilitate that child doing? It's mostly so the child can go and play. And play is the ultimate expression of freedom for its own sake, you know. Um, one could argue that's one of the constitutive principles of the universe, but that's another, another argument. <laughs> okay. So